Welcome to Upthinking Finance, a podcast that offers a unique and discerning view of economics and financial planning. Here is your host, Emerson Fersh. Welcome to another episode of Upthinking Finance. Journalist Robert Quillen once wrote, progress always involves risk. You can't steal second and keep one foot on first base. Today's episode is really geared towards anybody who'd like to learn a little more about the more nuanced aspects of investing in the financial markets. Uh, We'll be talking about the fiat currency system as well as quantitative analysis. And our guest today has a very good ability of taking complicated ideas and and breaking them down into ways that I think most people can understand. His name is Charles Ashley. He served as a portfolio manager of Catalyst Fund since 2017 and currently co-manages the Catalyst Systematic Alpha Fund. He joined Catalyst in February 2016 as a senior financial analyst where he supported the investment team by providing investment research and assisting with the day-to-day management of several of the Catalyst funds at that time. Charles has an MBA from the University of Michigan Ross School of Business and a BA from the Michigan State University Eli Broad College of Business. So it's my pleasure today to welcome, coming to us from Okemos, Michigan, which is just outside Lansing for anybody who's not familiar, um, Charles Ashley. Charles, welcome to Upthinking Finance. Thanks, Emerson. Thanks for having me on. Appreciate it. I'm grateful for your time today. So I thought the best place to start would be, um, we had a meeting a couple weeks ago, um, you and my uh, partner Amy and I, and we were talking about a lot of things. And I I thought it would be good to start with just a discussion of the currency markets, the fiat system, and and how that works. Because I, I think it's it's become more relevant today. People hear this stuff about the dollar you know, either being removed as a reserve currency or certainly losing its value. And I don't know that anybody really, everybody really understands how that works. So let me throw that in your lap and we'll, we'll start there. <laughs> that's a great starting spot because that, that's a lot to unpack. The, uh, I've heard that come up more than uh, on a couple of occasions about us losing the reserve currency status. And, you know, the, the, there's, there's different uh, currency, I don't want to call it cartels, but different pockets of influence around the globe that somewhat want us off of the, as a reserve currency, kind of gold standard leading currency. I don't think we're at at risk of that happening anytime soon, just to kind of preface it. But the currency market is is fascinating. So we use currencies in some of our strategies. Uh, One, I'm a portfolio manager on. Uh, We do a particular strategy called a currency carry, and that has hit the media recently. it, especially in August, there was talk about the yen carry trade unwind, right? And so I'll, I'll kind of unpack that. But, you know, as an asset class in investing, I think currencies sometimes get overlooked, especially from more of a, a retail clientele. Um, currencies are very popular with hedge funds and, and more institutional strategies. Uh, we do mutual funds at Catalyst, and, but we are doing something that's uh, called a, a degree of sophistication deeper than what you find in the typical 60-40 space. Um, so currencies as an investment vehicle are volatile. So there's, you know, every country has got some a currency that they use to exchange goods and services. Some are more stable than others. Developed markets have more stable currencies. Um, emerging markets tend to be uh, more volatile. And there's a number of things that go into what the value of the currency is. I mean, if you look at it from, say, domestically, like what does my dollar buy in terms of like a gallon of gas? I can buy a gallon of gas for $4. So what does that mean? Is is the dollar strong um, or is it weak? So if you look at it in isolation for your country's currency and what it gets you from a a product or service, it really depends on the amount of currency in in circulation and uh, what your underlying inflation is. From a global perspective, and I think where most people equate the strength of their currency is against another pair. So how strong is our dollar against, say, the euro, right? And that, as a traveler, you know, I like having a strong dollar against the euro because we we like to go vacation in Italy or in Europe. And it's it's nice having a strong dollar relative to the exchange rate against the euro because our our dollars go farther when the dollar is strong. so what bakes into how strong your currency is, there's a number of factors that bake into it. There's, a, there's quite a bit, but I'd say number one, it's, it's the inflation that you have in your country. It's the it's interest rates. So how stable is the central bank? What are your interest rates? What are the, what are the inflation rates? What is the amount of currency currently in circulation? But 
a lot also has to do with stability. So how is the perceived stability of the country? So a lot of geopolitical uh, influence comes into this. So how, how stable is the political environment in the country? And so when we look at it from a, a currency pair perspective, there are, there are ways to invest and take a directional view on whether or not your currency or a currency of another country is going to appreciate or depreciate against your currency. So for example, and we can, we can talk about this too, if you want to go there about the carry trade. Do you want me to go right into how that example works? You just said something and I'm thinking, okay, you, the travel example. Yeah, it's great if we, we have a, a dollar that's going to get us more in, in, in a foreign currency. But isn't that, so for what benefits like you and I and everybody else, it, it isn't actually necessarily great for the economy because there's also this issue of exports, which means, you know, because you, we have a stronger dollar, we can buy more in Europe. But that also means that Europeans and wherever else as the weaker is buying less of our stuff because they're not getting as much. And so that's a dynamic that just doesn't make sense to me. So that's a really good question because that has a major influence on the, the, the currency strength as well. So some countries, particularly exporting countries, so that have a, a positive balance of trade. So for example, an easy one to identify is China, right? China wants their goods and services to be relatively inexpensive compared to our goods and services. That way they can export more to us, right? They're, and they are a, you know, they, they're, they're considered the, the workshop for the, for the world, right? They, they produce uh, a, a, a large percentage of the physical goods that, um, that make up products that are on the shelves, you know, toys, and, you know, just about everything you can imagine. Um, well, a lot of um, like textiles and, and basic plastics and what have you, that's going to be produced in, in China as that kind of workshop for, for the globe. Now, it's in their best interest to have a weak yuan relative to the dollar because that means that they can export more. Now, China is kind of an interesting, um, uh, uh, interesting currency to unpack because they understand that they're an export country and they want to make sure that their currency is cheap relative to the dollar. So they were pegging the yuan to the dollar for many, many years in order to keep that exchange rate stable and therefore continue to make sure, you know, guarantee that their, their currencies are, are cheap. They can, you know, they're, meaning their goods are cheap for us to borrow or buy, excuse me. And so the, um, that has a really big impact depending on if your balance of trade is a, a surplus or a deficit. So if we're like United States, where we have a, a deficit for our balance of trade, so we want our dollar to be strong relative to, well, as a consumer, we want our dollar to be strong relative to other countries' production because we're a lot, we can buy things cheaper or we can buy higher quantities of it. As a, as a domestic manufacturer, however, a strong dollar isn't necessarily good if China or another country is exporting their cheaper products into our market. So there's there's implications for both domestic production as well as you know the competition against global uh, manufacturing. For the everyday consumer, though, like um, for myself, for example, you know the the stronger dollar, and I'm using this specific example about traveling. It helps me and my family go on vacations cheaper, and um, you know I like having a stronger dollar. Stronger dollar also is you know it, it's indicative of higher interest rates, so that's one of the things that impacts how how strong your currency is. Is because when when you have higher interest rates, that means relative to other countries. So a perfect example is is Japan, right? They've got very low interest rates. It's attractive for them to own dollars because they have a higher yield because our interest rates are higher relative to the yen. And so that's where you, the, the currency carry trade comes into play. But I'll stop there. In the end of the day, <laughs> it just seems like the individual, and this is my, my words, just really, they, they don't win either way because either, you, you, like you said, you have, we get more for our money overseas in, in certain situations. 
Um, but ultimately, the economy, you know, monetary policy to remain competitive is going to want to encourage a weak dollar to generate, you know, our, our beef up U.S. exports. And so what happens is, and tell me if this is right, because this is, again, these are things that seem kind of obvious, but not everybody understands, is, as you said, there's a correlation between currency values increase as, as local interest rates go up. So what happens is, is as the Fed, as an example, lowers rates like they did, effectively what they're doing is, is they're putting more money in the system, lowering the value of the dollar that theoretically makes U.S. exports more competitive, but at the same time is ultimately inflationary. Right? Is, is that a fair way to kind of summarize all that? Yes, that, that is a fair way to summarize that. So it's, it's interesting the way that the, the relationship that inflation has on interest rates and where we want to be in terms of Fed policy. You know, they've got the dual mandate where they want to maintain maximum employment and price stability. Right. So what is price stability that's that's taming inflation? So we want inflation to be low relative to our our GDP and what we're producing. Right. Because if if we have inflation that's that's running off the charts relative to our GDP, that means things are becoming more expensive for every American you know, on a daily day to day basis. So there's stagflation enters into the equation. If you don't have growth, you get your currencies and you still have inflation with no growth. You get that stagflation scenario. But it's a it's kind of a delicate balance for central banks to, to manage because they don't want to overheat the economy, which in turn will spur inflation. But they don't want the economy to be sluggish and, and, and crater so that we get widespread uh, unemployment. So they walk this balance. What is our maximum um, production potential for the United States? It's a growth somewhere that's a little bit shy of two percent. So what should our what is our neutral maximum production potential? It's it's around one point eight percent per year, and so we want inflation to remain somewhere in that neighborhood. And that's like the neutral rate for Fed policy. You know, they talk about R squared. How does that play into the equation? So the Fed wants a, a real rate, the R square for Fed funds, to be above the, the long-term inflation expectation plus some basis points on top of it. So just in kind of broad terms, 2.5%. So let's say it's 2% inflation is the target and then 0.5% uh, is the real return that you get on top of that. So the Fed funds rate, the neutral rate, is 2.5%. Um, now back to the, the kind of original question about inflation and then monetary policy and then, and then currencies and what that does, the inflationary pressures, rates go up, the Fed wants them to come back down because price stability, we want our goods and services, not just domestically, but as it relates to other countries, we want inflation to be tamed so that they're affordable for our, our domestic consumers. So when you get the scenario where where rates are coming down like they are right now, the Fed's cutting interest rates, what that does is that makes the, the, the rates cheaper that you can get on the dollars and less attractive from a foreign investor perspective. So foreign investors are less likely to find your currency appealing if it's only yielding 2%, yet they can go to New Zealand and the New Zealand currency is yielding 5 So there is that relationship. Currency yield is, is kind of an important uh, concept to understand because currencies do have a yield, right? And, and people think of currency, they don't, they don't generate anything if you got cash in the bank. Most people aren't earning a lot of money on cash that, you know, the everyday consumer, like I bank with Chase, what's Chase paying me in my savings account or my checking account? next to nothing but you can if you're if you're a financial institution you can loan your dollars out overnight and you can collect you know five percent well almost five percent right now um yeah per annum but by by lending your cash reserves out on an overnight basis so there is a there is a currency yield <clears throat> and it's directly impacted by central bank policy so Japan, the yen, the, the, the Bank of Japan has kept their rates artificially low for as long as I can remember, decades, right? And what they're trying to do, yeah, they're trying to spur inflation because they've had basically a deflationary issue for, for a long time. 
they're trying to stimulate the yen and have that appreciate and recently and up until just just recently the yen you could borrow you go over to go over to Japan and borrow yen for basically free 0.06% is what you could borrow yen up until the beginning of this year so I can go borrow yen at 0.06 then I can take it convert it into dollars and then because at the time our fed funds were 5.35% we could loan those dollars out on an overnight basis theoretically and collect 5.36%. So there's this, it's called, the fancy term is called interest rate differential. So it's the, the, the short-term interest rates across different countries that you have these, these differences in the currency yields and the ones with the, the countries with the higher rates tend to be more attractive from a yield generation perspective, right? Why, if I'm in Japan, why would I want to just sit, park my, yet in the bank earning nothing when I could be in the United States, park it in the bank theoretically and get five and a 5.35 percent. So that's the that's kind of the thing about people's understanding that currencies do have a yield. But most people aren't aware of it because their banks are not paying them what the true yield on their currency should be. That's kind of more on the institutional side, what banks lend to each other on an overnight basis. That's interesting. So one thing I've taken out of this, if you're going to go travel, Japan is a good place to go <laughs> if you're living in the U.S. I've never been, but I've heard it's absolutely amazing. Like, wow. You know what? This is totally irrelevant. But you know those pictures that come up on your screensaver yeah. when you like log in? Every time I think, gosh, that's beautiful. It's always Japan. So there's a plug for traveling uh, over to Japan. So where does this carry? Because I know we were going to talk about this, this whole incident that happened that drove all the U.S. markets down. It was a couple of days or a week or so that where it was pretty significant in a very short amount of time. Maybe run through how that happened. Yeah, um, definitely. Let me let me share my screen with you because I want to just isolate what the carry trade is. So care, currency carry, that, that can kind of be, you know, that's a $10 word in a way. Um, but the... The currency carry is, it's not overly complex or sophisticated. Here's an example. So in a, in a currency carry trade, what you're doing is you're essentially, you're borrowing the cheapest to borrow currencies, and then you're loaning in the most expensive to borrow currencies. So the, the one that kind of blew up in late July, early August was the yen dollar cross, the yen carry trade. So that made the, the financial headlines. Um, that was a persistent winner uh, for us in particular. But in this example, and we talked about it just a, sec, um, a moment ago, the Bank of Japan up until early this year, you could get, you could borrow yen at 0.06%, convert it to dollars, loan the dollars out, collecting 5.36%. So the carry opportunity is 5.3%. That's like your embedded edge for the trade. So they call it carry because you're carrying the risk that that, that foreign exchange rate is gonna run against you. Um, but before the market opens, if you put this trade on, you have this 5.3% embedded edge. So what impacts the profit, it kind of sounds like a quasi arbitrage. Um, it's not a pure arb because what impacts the profitability of that trade is the, the foreign exchange rate between yen and dollar, but you still have, by doing that trade, you still have a 5.3% edge. So in order for you to lose money, you've got to have basically the yen has to appreciate 5.3% before you get kind of wiped out and start, not wiped out, but before you actually are in a losing position. And that seems like, I mean, I'm not an expert on this, but that seems like a pretty significant jump because these are fairly short-term trades normally. Is that right? So typically we use a uh, one month forward contract. So it's a derivative, it's like a future. Um, and they're, they're basically, they're rolling one month forward contracts between the pairs. So you, you can still, there's still ways to implement the strategy. There are some ETFs and I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna mention because I know we have some, um, you know, certain uh, compliance issues, but there, there are ETFs that do currency carry trades. Um, 
and that can be, you know, you can take a view through through some of those. They're, I think, for the most part, they're, they're pretty select. You want to be careful when putting these trades on because if, to the unexperienced, it, currency markets can get pretty dicey really quick. There's been blow-ups. I mean, it primarily happens with, with emerging market currencies, but we've seen extremely rapid devaluations uh, throughout history. There was some big blow-ups in the 80s, 90s. Um, Latin America, um, there's, yeah, there's been some, some blow ups with currencies. So highly recommended to use the G10 currencies, which are the most stable currencies in the world. They're the westernized banks. They play nice with one another. Um, they're not subject to rapid devaluation. Um, but in, after the financial crisis, we were basically, or excuse me, not the financial crisis, COVID after the pandemic, when the Fed slashed to zero, interest rates to zero, that was kind of across the board across developed countries. Just about everybody went to the zero bound, right? And so there wasn't really very good carry opportunities. When you're in a zero interest rate environment around the world, or at least around the developed world, this trade is more difficult to implement because if we're at, you know, we're at the zero bound, Japan's at the zero bound, it doesn't make sense to put that trade on. And so currency carry in a way was somewhat left for dead as interest rates really over the past couple of decades globally just kind of descended. And now there's been a bit of a resurgence because we had after, after the pandemic and once, uh, once inflation started to rear its head, our central banking policy started to deviate around the globe. And so you get this, these, these kind of uneven um, interest rate increases across the major economies, which made this carry trade much more attractive. And all of a sudden it becomes back in vogue. A lot of, a lot of hedge funds start to get into it. We've been in it for ever since the pandemic started and before that, but it made this carry in the yen, yen dollar in particular much more attractive. And so this became very popular um, for hedge funds. They, they started to get a little bit crowded and, you know, there's a life cycle to every trade. Well, that actually makes sense because, um, I mean, in reality, if everybody's at zero and then eventually, you know, it, we'll use the U.S., rates start to go up in order to control inflation and, you know, whatever. Um, but you have a country like Japan who's, as you said earlier, holding it to zero I mean, it's a natural gap. It's it's there, and you're getting a certainty, at least in some senses, with with Japan policy because it's been locked in. So, so that just makes sense. So you expose it, you take advantage of it. Yeah, and that was a great trade for a long time, like anything. So life cycle of a trade, right? The people that invent the the trade are the ones that make the most money on it. They they get the most alpha, and then you get early adopters, and they they, they still make some alpha. There's there's good money to be made by the smaller set of investors, and then as it becomes more widespread and mainstream, and you're you know the the taxi cab drivers telling you about this great currency carry strategy, then that's you know that's when it's unravel right because it's becoming too crowded, and that's when things tend to blow up. Well, there was a lot of people in this trade, and it was very profitable. A lot of hedge funds were in this. And because of the stability of the, the borrowing rate, and, and this was kind of like a head fake for a lot of um, sell-side investment bank strategists were predicting the massive uh, appreciation of the yen last year that never materialized. But um, the Bank of Japan, Ueda, the new in incoming governor, he assumed the role, um, I believe it was... It was either April or, or May of this year when he was sworn in. Um, but it was widely anticipated that the, he was going to lift them off from that zero bound and start the first rate hikes for the yen for decades. So the expectation starts, you know, the, the market starts this, the expectation that he's going to raise rates, and he finally does it. July was when the currency carry trade started to kind of unwind a little bit. And I... And, I've heard accounts that there was some form of manipulation by the Japanese in exacerbating yen moves. I'm not here to throw a stone because we're all currency manipulators, every single one of us. But they exacerbated some of the moves in the yen. But because the because Ueda lifted rates, 
that started to jiggle out some of the, this crowded trade and whether or not there's intervention and the exacerbation of that move, the yen is starting to rapidly appreciate. So in July, this, this appreciation is kind of picking up speed and these currency carry trades where you're short the yen along the dollar, now that's starting to, um, starting to lose money pretty quickly. And so you're getting covering by, um, by hedge funds which exacerbate the move, right? Because if you're if you're short the yen, which is in this currency carry trade example, you're you're shorting the yen, you're selling the yen. Essentially, when I say borrow it and then you sell it to buy dollars, you're you're short the yen. And so short yen long dollar and as the, the yen's appreciating and you're getting margin called and you have to start covering your your losing um, trade you have to buy yen. So if you're short yen and now all of a sudden you have to cover, you're buying yen and exacerbating the move as well. So it was a pretty, it was a pretty sharp move. So you've got to come up with liquidity to cover the, this, 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 the, the margin call. And that's why, is that, that's why the equity markets sell off because that's where the money's coming from. Is that right? From the drawing the parallels, a lot of events took place in, in early August, and it was, and a lot of the investors kind of missed the, the bigger global picture of what happened. I know we got impacted kind of more, uh, more so because we are, we have global exposures. So there was some, there was some soft data out of, out of Japan, and there was some worries about the economy and the, the interest rate hike and the, the rapid appreciation of the yen, some of it I think was a, a flight to safety, but on August 5th, the Nikkei 225, which is essentially Japan's total market equity index, so it's like our S&P 500, so the Nikkei 225 started to get volatile. So it was doing fantastic, splendid. Like Japan, that, that market, yeah, it peaked out at in 1989, and it hasn't reached new highs since then until just recently. And so the the strength of the of the of the Nikkei has been pretty magnificent. Great for if you're trend following on the Nikkei, you did really well over the past couple of years. But the volatility started to rear its head, and there was a massive flight to safety. So whether or not it was directly the result of this this yen carry trade unwind, I think it was more so about the, the jitters of the the economic data coming in. But the the Nikkei was down twelve and a half percent on August fifth. That's a Black Monday nineteen eighty seven crash for that market. You know, think about it. If you're if you're an investor, if you got a sixty forty portfolio in Japan and you got sixty percent the Nikkei two twenty five and that just lost twelve and a half percent a day, that hurts, right? Um, but that ended up rippling over domestically. So Japan's closing as we're kind of, their market's closing as we're waking up over here in the States and our volatility is starting to increase. Like I, I remember like it was yesterday, I was looking at my Bloomberg screen pre-market. I'm just watching. I knew what happened in Japan. I knew what happened with the yen, but all of a sudden the VIX is skyrocketing and it's all pre-market. So liquidity event triggering this VIX spike. So it was, it was a, I mean, it was a massive move, 40 point move in the VIX. That's historic. That's never happened. But there was some unwinds that took place, right? You got some lever trades. Um, some books got unwound. I heard that one hedge fund took a $300 million hit that day. Um, but it was, it was a volatile market. And part of it that hit us was that rapid increase in the VIX that was on like basically a lot of that unwind was done pre-market be before the cash open equities here in the States. And the order books for the VIX were basically like 20 times lower than what they normally would be. So whoever's getting liquidated is getting liquidated pre-cash open into an order book that's got nothing. And so the the gap higher in the VIX was, I mean, it was very Volmageddon-like. Volmageddon. <laughs> that's a good one. I haven't heard that before. Volmageddon. Yeah, Volmageddon was an event in 2018. Um, some people call it Vixmageddon. In February, there February 2018, there was there was another VIX spike. Same same playbook. It was I saw it. It, it was very reminiscent of that period. Pre market, pre equity market open, the VIX is just gapping, 
just skyrocketing on on basically an illiquidity move because order books didn't have enough liquidity in it to 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 offset the yeah whatever product was getting unwound. But there was some failures uh, in twenty eighteen. There was some triple levered um, products to the VIX that were that were inverse. So it was inverse VIX, and so as that VIX was spiking, these triple levered products were losing a ton of money and having to cover their shorts, further exacerbating the move. So that those products got, those, they took a dirt nap, but um, so kind of a similar move here just recently in August. Um, but yeah, so, but the S&P didn't overreact either. Typically when you get a VIX move like that, there's a massive um, issue going on. Like you don't see those type of, well, I've never seen a VIX move that, that, that gap 40 points intraday. But even like in the worst of COVID, it didn't even do this. So it was an ill liquidity event kind of, like there's a liquidity problem pre-market that you just get this gappiness higher in the VIX and the equity market when it opens, things start to stabilize. Even though we had a pretty crummy open for the S&P, I think it, it still rallied and was only down, I want to say like 2% on a day. I have to go back and check my numbers, but. Yeah, it was real extreme in the beginning. I remember that. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. But once once the market opened and then the order books filled up, things calmed down and the equity market kind of retraced its, you know, that loss. And it was yeah, it's one of those one of those events. If you're fast enough to be able to act on it and recognize it as a as a illiquidity event, you could have made quite a bit of money on it. Yeah. Well, I guess the same old lessons that we hear time and time again about diversifying your risk, you know, I think it's all you know, I mean if that like you said earlier, if this kind of a strategy is a small portion of an exposure. You know, things happen, but, you know, when you, greed kicks in for some and they start, you know, hitching their, their, their wagon to one horse, um, that's when problems can start. So, well, gosh, okay, so we're halfway into this and we've, <laughs> I appreciate the explanation. I hope, I think that's helpful for people to understand the relationships. Obviously, it's really complicated. And then you throw in the geopolitical stuff. And I mean, and, and you know, and also again with this rising rate, I mean, we have a trend following model. We're clients of a of a analyst over in Europe that we get data from. I think we shared that with you the other day. And you know, the currency it's been you know the correlation to interest rates has made it very difficult um, in, in short term bites. Other than really the Japan exposure is the one, but everything else is just it's it's you know there's really been directionless for the most part. Um, but anyway, so let's shift gears because you're a quantitative anal, uh, uh, analyst, I guess. You, you manage money using quantitative analysis. And so how does that differ just to compared to your standard, you know, large cap mutual fund that just sort of does their research, buys stuff? Can you maybe just give a high level? Because I think people hear this stuff all the time and I'm not sure they really understand the difference. Yeah, quants. What 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 is that exactly? What does that mean? What's a quant besides someone that's got a computer and glasses? And <laughs> you're right. <laughs> There's a number of different um, ways to kind of dissect this. So, quant is it's it's numbers, like it's quantitative, right? It's numbers. So if you're if you're doing a statistical analysis, you can draw conclusions that there's relationships for certain factors that explain returns of particular markets. So there's really been this rise of quantitative investing for the past couple of decades. Some hedge funds are really just quant heavy. That's all they do is analyze data. Um, because as you know, as data becomes more accessible, everything's becoming digitized, it, it enables people to very conveniently get just tons of data to analyze and then draw parallels or conclusions that, okay, these certain factors can explain stock returns, right? And so I think a lot of people think quant. What, so what are they trying to unpack? So there's, we've, we've worked with numerous quants over the years. And um, I went to the University of Michigan, and Kai Patanen, he's a pretty, very well-respected uh, quant. Um, and he uses multi-factor analysis where it's on stock specific. So you can analyze um, stocks based on a quantitative modeling, try to explain what has driven the returns of the S&P 500 over the past decade. So, you know, you got a number of different factors. There, there's hundreds of different factors you can analyze, but most people are familiar with like 
PE ratio or sales growth or PEG ratios, price to earnings growth. Um, and essentially, you model the return stream of the, call it the index, or let's, let's even get more granular. You take the return streams of 500 stocks over a period of time, maybe it's a year, maybe your horizon is five years, and you look at all of your factors. If your model has got 50 different metrics, you do a statistical analysis on the return stream to see what factors have are, are basically have the most influence, the most predictive quality, right? And so a lot of people started using quantitative analysis for stock picking. So it, you know, they could explain, okay, well, the, the S&P was driven by these returns, or you know, if you invested in companies that exhibit these qualities, whether you know, it's your PE ratio, you want a low PE ratio, which doesn't make sense because this, you know, the, the S&P 500 right now, right? It's driven by the max seven, which are categorized by IPE ratios. But for an example standpoint, anyway, so if, if you can explain that, you know, 60% of the return was driven, they all exhibited this quality or this, this metric, then that becomes something that you want to screen stocks for. Okay, so I know that 60% of the returns were explained by companies that exhibited this metric. And then you, you build your quant model based around the factors that, that can explain or the companies that did the best have these, these particular metrics. So, but it changes over time, which is the interesting thing. So there's, I mean, quantitative analysis Especially like for the stock picking side of things, you know, the factors that are working right now may not work next year, right? If we, if we shift from say like momentum investing or, or stocks that are kind of like the index heavy weights that are categorized by like high PE ratios, you know, maybe next year it's like value comes in the, in the, in the favor. And all of a sudden that, that's the metric that everybody's focusing on. So there is an element of human involvement here in terms of setting up the parameters and deciding when to make these adjustments. It's not necessarily a plug and play. Okay. This is our model. I mean, I guess it can be in our contact in, in uh, Europe. I mentioned, you know, he's got a trend following model. He hasn't changed since 2003. The parameters are all the same. Um, but again, I'm the point being that is his way. And so where, so, so there is some element of, I don't know, is it fair to say subjectivity, at least in determining what matters? And then once you put your thing in place, then you, you know, then it just runs its thing and, and there's nobody in there, you know, putting any emotion to it beyond that. Is that, am I getting that right? That's a very fair assessment. I think you, you, you have to have a human logic override. Um, Gigo is a concept. G-I-G-O. Garbage in, garbage out. Right, so you have to you, you have to employ some form of logic, and, and it's got to pass the, the the smell test, right? So, a good example is like I've seen some, I've been to some software programs that just have these massive reams of data, and it's you know you'll get a result if you have, it's like okay, it's it was in commodity the commodity space in particular, it's like okay if you sell if you short crude oil on October 5th and go along to Kansas City hard winter wheat on October 7th and then close that trade on December 18th, you make money 10 out of the last 12 years. But why is that? That relationship may not make sense. Let me give you another example. Okay, so if you say, all right, so the S&P 500, if it's the third Tuesday of the month and the moon is a full moon and that explains the S&P will have an average return of 0.56% over the past 20 years. So it's like what the, the relationship really doesn't hold really for me at all in that scenario, nor does it with, I don't understand why, you know, there'd be a relationship with crude oil and Kansas City wheat, but there are certain things that would make sense to me. So, for example, and I'm going back to commodities as well because we 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 use commodities. Um, why? Okay, so there's a trade where you buy feeder cattle, 
and you buy corn and you short live cattle. Why does that trade make sense? I don't know why. What, what is the basis for shorting feeder cattle, short, or excuse me, buying feeder cattle, buying corn, and then shorting live cattle for a future delivery day? And what that is, it's actually, it, it makes money persistently. What the logic behind that is, is, is it replicates a, a cattle feeder operation where they basically, you're, you're, ideally, you're getting the, the gross margins of what a feeder cattle business is, right? You're buying the feeder cattle's contracts, the futures. You're buying corn, which you feed, which are used to feed the feeder cattle. And then eventually you're selling the live cattle. And so some trades are pretty interesting from, from that standpoint. And so there are, and where I'm going with this, is there are patterns that do make sense if you put a hu you know, human logic override. Does it pass the smell test? And is my, is my logic robust enough to where we think that this is a valid data point? Does it make sense in the world of investing? So there, quant, quant um, in general, like quantitative investing, it stems out of academia, right? Statistical analysis and drawing parallels between investing and the use of statistics. And quants have to have to put a very, um, you know, they, they have to have reasoning and a rationale for why this makes sense. You can make all kinds of parallels based on, you know, troves of data, and it really just doesn't make sense from a real world perspective. No, that's okay. He, I was listening to gentleman I sent you, Russell Napier over there in Edinburgh. He actually did a uh, webinar. Just I listened to it last week. I was driving back from California, and he was talking about it was the twenty one lessons you can learn from financial history. And one of them was if you're uh, traveling somewhere, like on a cruise ship or some venue. You know, he was off. I forget where he said he was, but he and this is it. it there's a. It's not literal but it's the idea behind it he says find out who all the where all the people are from that are traveling and he said and they were all from like a couple of places he goes then go short their currency you know it's sort of the same thing you're saying if you're traveling and but the point was really was the you know what's it's human behavior you know you can't it's it's effectively what you're saying too you know is there is some place for you know i, I what did you say human override i like that looking and seeing what's going on around you and looking at human behavior because it you can't dismiss it entirely. So anyway, I, that's interesting to hear. In some of our strategies, we, we take advantage of human behavior. There, it's, there is human emotional bias in investing that is exploitable. Um, there's no doubt about that. We, you know, just as humans, we have, we have emotions, we have behavioral biases. Loss aversion is one of those big ones that's in the financial markets. So loss aversion... Um, I'm going to read the definition of it that we have right here. Loss aversion, the fear of losing money is stronger than the positive feeling from making money, right? So we all have that to some degree. Some people, you know, have a very limited amount of it. Some of them that have a, a extreme amount of it that don't want to take any risks, right? So what does that boil down to in the markets is a lot of times, well, market makers make a ton of money by selling protection to the market because loss aversion. People want to protect against loss, so they're willing to irrationally overpay to protect against losses, right? You see it in the options market every single day. Market makers make a ton of money for selling you the, the put option on the S&P 500, right? People irrationally overpay. Historically, you know, if you do it long enough, you're going to go to zero because on a long-term basis, it'll work every once in a while and give you the protection that you need, but long-term, it's a money-losing um, proposition if you're the buyer of that protection okay so this will kind of transition into our, the last part of our discussion which is the, the the portfolio you manage in terms of this combining of strategies but i want to ask because that's a good point and the the challenge as a person on my side of the desk so to speak is when we're working with people clients you know we set goals the whole the drill and you know my mind is always to get people from a to c and what happens at b um, and I've seen this, you know, I could, you know, any time anybody's been in this industry long enough, you've seen people make some really, you know, unfortunate decisions in fearful moments where they sell at absolutely the wrong time. And that could be a whole, in fact, I did an episode on this from of me just sharing these stories of people, you know, and it's, and it's unfortunate. And so that expensive protection you're, you're bought, you're talking about, there is a peace of mind element, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a trade-off, you know, I get it. 
Um, it, you know, but in the moment, I can tell you there's times, as you can imagine, I mean, I, it, which leads me to a question here, and then the, maybe this will steer you into what you do. Um, but there, there is a, a, a point where people would, would, are, are would rather, like you said, have a portfolio that maybe is going to cut some upside, but certainly manage a downside. And so if, if, so here's the question, and then let's talk about what you do, um, here, but it's, is, is the whole point of, of QA to enhance returns or alphas, I guess, you know, for the amount of risk you're taking, or is it more designed to, um, reduce beta, you know, manage the risk, or is it a combination of both? So that, that would be my thing, and then maybe talk about how that fits into what you do. There's a number of different ways and reasons to use quantitative analysis. Some of it is, you know, if we're looking at like the stock, from a stock picking standpoint, that's to pick stocks that are going to outperform, right? But there are quantitative analysis or, or quant strategies that are looking to harvest premia or call it alpha in pockets of the market that are more non-traditional. So a lot of what hedge funds do are it's non-traditional investing, things that, you know, we at Catalyst, we think of like the 60-40 portfolio, which is prevalent in, in the retail market. And what we're trying to do is diversify that. So we want to bring in return streams that are that help smooth the returns of the overall 60-40 portfolio because people are just over reliant on that model. That's 60-40 is long only, and it's generally just going to be stocks and bonds. That's what people are used to. And you take periods of time, like in 2022, you know that 60-40 portfolio got destroyed. You know you, 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 the the correlations that have been enjoyed between the fixed income market and the S and P 500. It correlated in 22, and there was no safety for 6040. That was a painful year. What we want to do, and what most hedge funds are, are doing, is, and I'm not, we're a mutual fund too, by the way. Um, we're trying to help diversify that return stream. So it's how can we bring in a strategy that 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 is non-traditional that's gonna that's gonna help smooth the sequence of returns for the portfolio. Over the over market cycles, right? And when you do that, what happens is you get a a better risk adjusted return. So that's the sharp ratio, right? By by introducing more strategies that are uncorrelated, gives you a better risk adjusted return. And that's theory. But Harry Markowitz won a Nobel Prize on it, right? The efficient frontier modern portfolio theory. Um, a lot of a lot of the market, I think, kind of left him, the, that theory kind of abandoned a little bit. But I just think it's not properly applied. What the the brilliance of what he mathematically was able to prove is that the best risk adjusted return stream is by increasing the amount of uncorrelated strategies that have a positive expected return. So. S and P five hundred is not diversification. That's not that doesn't fit into that bucket. That's five hundred stocks. That's you know you're taking equity risk by investing in S and P five hundred. So we're trying to bring in uncorrelated return streams, and so that was kind of where the the, the foundations of the product that w one of our funds and I, uh, I won't I won't plug it, but it's it's based on properly applying that that philosophy. We want to blend in multiple return streams that are uncorrelated, but yet all have a positive expected return. And when we do that, the correlations of, of our product have generally low correlation to the S&P 500 and the Bloomberg Ag or fixed income in general. And so by combining these strategies and blending it into a 60-40 portfolio, it gives us that better risk adjusted overall return stream. So that's that's kind of the, the riddle that we're trying to solve in a way. And we do, at Catalyst, we do a lot of hedge fund conversions where we'll find hedge fund managers that are exceptional, but aren't great at asset raising, and then we'll convert them and then we'll into a mutual fund and their strategies are basically bought like wildfire from more of a retail mutual fund investor that you know, can access that because quite frankly, most people don't have the capability of 
going and knocking on hedge fund managers' doors and investing with them. There's a lot of barriers to entry there. This has really been great. I I'm, I'm appreciate because you're explaining this stuff in ways I think people can, can, can grasp. So in my mind, this approach is more relevant today. And I may be wrong. I'm just saying this is how I see it. Today, given a lot of the outside things that maybe don't even directly impact the models, which would be all the geopolitical shifts, which would be this, you know, I mean, the EU, again, that's geopolitical, but seems to be falling apart. You know, you mentioned earlier how, you know, these everybody's kind of out for themselves in a sense with their currencies and their policies. And so um, versus a world where interest rates are going down for 40 years and, you know, and, and, and all that. I, so to me that it just seems like you want something that's going to address what you're saying. That's not just putting, because I know, you know, there are people who had money in 60, 40 that even right now, after the last two years at the beginning of 2022, still haven't made it all up yet. That portion of the portfolio, because it's just so static. And, and so is that fair? Do you say it's more, am I, I mean, I'm not putting words in your mouth, but would you argue that it's more relevant today than say it would have been 20, 30 years ago? If you could even do it. What has kind of enabled that to be able to have more of these quantitative type strategies that are non-traditional, call it. Um, you have, you basically have the markets becoming more sophisticated. You have the, the, um, the rise of more complex uh, ways to invest. So you've got derivatives, you've got futures, you've got forwards, you've got options, you've got, you've got a lot of different ways to get invested in the market, which opens up possibilities for looking at things from different avenues, right? It is the market exploitable. Let's face it. Every manager is looking to exploit the market in one way. We're, we're doing this for a reason, right? We're not, we're not here just to collect a paycheck. We want to make money and we want to be the best ones to and, and exploit the market because we have a superior idea or product um, to get us there. And so these these strategies that like we use, we use a multi strategy multi-asset class, it's long and short. Um, they're, they're more of a, a kind of like a pocket of the market that most people just don't have the capability of exploiting. Right. So the most people don't think of currency carry. We use a commodity carry strategy. We use a, a one of the ones that basically uh, works on uh, loss aversion. Um, we use some momentum strategies, but because it's 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 non-traditional, it's it's not long only investing. It gives us um, just a better, I think, way to invest. Because, and everything to us boils down to sharp ratio in investing, right? We want to have the best risk-adjusted return stream. And so being able to find that, a sharp of one and above is superior to what the S&P sharp ratio is or the bond egg sharp ratio. And so it's you have to go outside of long-only stocks, long bonds to be able to get that. I tell you what. I've shared before, I've been doing this for a while now at the retail level with clients. And that was like the, the epiphany of my career <laughs> a few years ago when I realized this one-sided view, the long only side, you're cutting off a whole half of return potential or risk management. It just, it, you know, it was like a light bulb just went on and it was like, duh. And then as you said, you know, then the challenge becomes how do you get these kind of, this kind of asset management to, you know, the, the, you know, the person with, you know, a small amount of money and you can through funds and these other things, which is great. Um, yeah, I'm a total convert to it. It just, it just makes logical sense in my brain. And then we've seen the benefits, um, even, you know, this year with these, these nuanced strategies. And, you know, I mean, the type of people we work with are happy getting a, you know, a, a double digit return with, you know, significantly less risk that also addresses a lot of these other things that are going on, um, you know, primarily through, as you said, just not only styles, but different really broader asset classes. So, um, yeah, no, no, I, I totally get it. You know, it, it's good to hear from somebody who's, who's in the middle of it. Um, listen, I, Charles, I appreciate the time. This has been a great conversation. And, I, you know, I'd like to set something up again in the next several months just to kind of connect because, um, I think it's important for people to to really broaden their view of, of what's out there. And, you know, at least for me, the days of just plopping stuff in a fund and forgetting about it, you know, that just doesn't 
really seem like it's in the best interest of, of, of a lot of people. I guess it depends on where you are age wise. So I'm not making recommend blanket recommendations, but our typical client retired approaching retirement, you know, you've got a lot of things that can go sideways. In fact, you know, we've got another firm we work with at resolve that puts out a lot of material about, you know, the risks of that three years before and three years after that sequence of returns. And it's not something you can just predict. It's just, it, it's the luck of the draw. You retire in 2007, that could really derail you, you know, versus retiring, say in 1981, you know, when everything just kind of took off. So anyhow, I know I'm preaching the choir. Yeah, no, those Resolve guys are great. I like, I really like the Resolve guys. Yeah, they're kind of all in. And I, I've enjoyed these kind of conversations because, you know, with people like you, it just seems like there's more of a depth to what you're doing. And and, and I've said it a number of times, but a bit of a passion. You know, I think they're, you know, you, you, you choose a career in this kind of work. I think, you know, it's it's certainly beyond just a paycheck. I mean, ultimately, we're all working. We're not doing it for our health. But I think there's there's a an element of a, I won't say crusade, but certainly a mission to try to open minds and broaden things and, and find new truths. And, and I, I'm just, I'm, you know, I'm all in with that. So uh, anyway, I just want to thank you. Thank you for your time today. And uh, thanks for being with me on Upthinking Finance. My pleasure. It's been fun. I, you know, I'm looking forward to talking to you again in the future. This is great. Thanks, Emerson. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. Thank you. Emerson Fersh is a registered representative with and securities offered through LPL Financial, member FINRA, SIPC. Advisor services offered through LPL Financial, a registered investment advisor and separate entity from Capital Investment Advisors. The opinions voiced in this podcast are for general information only and are not intended to provide specific advice or recommendations for any individual. To determine which strategies or investments may be suitable for you, consult the appropriate qualified professional prior to making a decision. The guest speakers and the companies they represent are not affiliated with or endorsed by LPL Financial or Capital Investment Advisors. Individual tax and legal matters should be discussed with your tax or legal expert. Economic forecasts set forth may not develop as predicted and there can be no guarantee that strategies promoted will be successful. All performance referenced is historical and is no guarantee of future results. All indices are unmanaged and may not be invested into directly. There is no assurance that the techniques and strategies discussed are suitable for all investors or will yield positive outcomes. The purchase of certain securities may be required to affect some of the strategies. Investing involves risks, including possible loss of principal.